you've heard a lot about the source of spasmodic dysphoria. And I think if we're gonna find a cure for this, we have to rely on our colleagues, the uh, neurologists, but that because it's a central problem. We're just patching it up uh, at, as symptomatic at this junction here, because this is the neuromuscular junction. And the way the botrys works, it occupies some of the receptors. It blocks the secretion of acetylcholine, which activates the muscles, which is why the botrys works in the muscle mainly. But uh, today I'm gonna talk briefly I'm going to just squeeze through the voice therapy Botox and then uh, mention selective adductor denervation and renovation, just in case you've heard this somewhere, you know what it is. But I don't think many people practice this in the UK. I, I don't know a single person that does this lab. Even in the US, it's a handful of people, maybe two or three people that do that regularly. But I'm just going to mention so that you know what it is. Some smart cookies among you may go and develop these areas. So this is why we're mentioning lots of techniques because you guys are young, you're coming brain, always switch on like that. You may have it like something that you're going to develop in future. Paroplasty type two, again, it's not yet available uh, in Europe. Uh, not because we cannot do that, it's just because of the CE mark that it takes a long time. I've been chasing this uh, since 2015, the first time I met Ishiki when he came to my course in Manchester and invited him and then I went back over there and then he sold the patency company to Noble Pharma Company, and they've applied for CE Mark, and then the Brexit came, and then everything changes, and they keep shifting shift the goalposts now. So maybe 2024, 2025, that we're going to have uh, type 2 for spasmodic dysphonia. CO2 laser, mixed results with it as well, uh, and I will tell you why uh, during the course of this talk. And this is our friend again, uh, that touches his leg. You've seen this video already, so I don't need to play it back. Uh, but there is. Would you mind telling us how you? Yeah, uh, this guy when he comes to me, I only just do the botox injection to the TA. But after listening to you, I think there's a lot going on in this guy that I probably have. Yeah, you, Flora. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he said that he's choosing his neck yes. already to one side, and you're absolutely right. And I had another patient after this you may see, that comes to my clinic. I inject the TA, but then he has torticollis. But his torticollis was so severe that even a blind person cannot miss that because he comes to my clinic like that. So I inject all over his neck with 500 units of despot and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's stretching his leg again and he goes out. Uh, but this guy is more than just that. And I'm just going to play. You, you find that it's not a typical spasmodic dysphonia. The one thing that never ceases to amaze me with these patients, when you inject the Botox, they said it does work for them. And Sometimes I was, is it really working for this patient? Because I never see them when they don't have the symptoms. It's when they're worse, that's when I see them. Uh, that was one of the patients that I had to ask this patient to send a recording just so that I know I have the feeling that I'm making a difference for this patient. Would you mind telling us how your voice affects you? Well, it doesn't, it sends a bit happy. Really, it's, it's been good. It's good. Uh, but at first, God didn't really do it because they didn't know what to do. They didn't even know about the injections. So, but since I've been having the injections, I can say it's it, four yeah. months. Thank you. What about that? Is anything you can add on that, Flora? Uh, it's a very mild cervical twisting there, but I wouldn't uh, like I was talking and I literally didn't understand a word. <laughs> but, uh, this is this is not a northern accent in the UK. So <laughs> yeah, that's it's my you know, typical Manchester accent when I used to work over there. And this one again. So this is the patient not talking, just I'm just copying. And this is and the vocal cord is dancing. Uh. <laughs> One leg. <laughs> <laughs> Almost completely slow. For me, as an ENT, common ENT, I just want to bang it for the patient out. But I'm sure 
There's a lot here that we're not seeing. The point I'm trying to make here today is we need to go back and find our neurology colleagues, especially those that have expertise with uh, more, uh, with, uh, uh, movement disorders. I've got a few in my hospital, but I don't even know where they are. And I think this has really worked well. Uh, again, you've seen this guy, with the, he's a famous rugby player in the UK, so I'm not going to play this anymore. Um, this is a very interesting one. I just throw this one in because when you're dealing with this kind of patients with spasmodic dysphonia, you're going to see cases whereby is it spasmodic dysphonia? Is it functional dysphonia? Is it especially the abductor type? The abductor spasmodic dysphonia, where the voice is very, very quiet like that. Sometimes you don't know, is it is that the AB doctor or is it just functional? Uh, sometimes you have mix. Uh, and we send this patient to clinical psychologist because we think he's psycho psychogenic. But this patient, he is a psychologist himself, he's a clinical psychologist, and yeah. in themselves. So, and this is his voice. And I thought this was an abductor spasmodic dysphonia. And, and I did visual biofeedback therapy. This is very long. So let it come from here. I'm doing this therapy for this patient. Give me a small cup. A big I'm cup. Here. Yeah. Mm -mm. He's teaching him some glossal attack. There's no Botox involved in this at all. And this is just one session. He was watching the screen, trying to learn what's happening, and he had a feeling as well. And he was just amazed. He was panicking, actually, when he hears his voice. For the first time. Just one session. Again. One, two, three, four, five. Again. Again. Good. Okay. Okay. One, yes. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's eight. Ten nine, because he was, he didn't hear his voice for such a long problems. time. Since the early, the mid thirties. Mid thirties. So thirty years. He's, he's had this problem. And he's been through all sort of speech therapy. I do this therapy occasionally, and usually patients have been everywhere. I'm very cautious with my speech therapy colleagues in Canada because I've been someone said to me, hey, you're moving, you're encroaching in our territory. I said, well, you've tried this and it didn't work, and what do I do? And this is the patient three months after. Can you count one to five for me again? One, two, three, four, That's five. He carried on like that. So these patients, when they come to the clinic, there's more than just spasmodic dysphonia. You have to really open your eyes, your ears, and everything. It's completely a different person. Uh, again, I have just spasmodic dysphonia. This is not my video. This is something I just slipped from the internet. After the rock. This is my favorite film with the torticollis. So this guy, when he comes, I inject uh, 100 units of Daughters. Yeah, des de I think desperate. Yeah, desperate. 100 units there, 50 units there. Uh, in fact, I didn't stop counting because he, <laughs> he, he knows exactly where to inject. And he just said to me, inject here and I just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to play that video now and you can see what. Rock them after. He could never make up his mind whether, whether his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them. He would only answer, I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, you know my jaws go some pain out. I've got tightness in the jaws, you know. So the problem with this, with this donor, you, you got you got different muscles. So you have to monitor every different muscle in the throat and neck. And this man in the mouth. So it does affect the in your speech and your uh, and your posture. In fact, different people different ways. So not everybody's the same. There's always a variation, you no. Know? So he's very knowledgeable there. I inherited this patient from my predecessor, and it was the first time I injected outside the larynx. And I said to him, look, I've not done this injection. What do I do? And he said to me, I will teach you. 
<laughs> and he told me that those days waiting, that luckily in his notes, there's a map of all the logismos and capacities and all these muscles that I'm relearning again uh, from the anatomy. Another interesting one that I yeah, Could you stick your tongue out for I'm me? I'm glad you mentioned <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's all right. An easy one. But this was special, this special was a category of biologist activities. And of course, what is <laughs> But obviously, well, I thought I was the one having the tinnitus when the patient came to my clinic, but actually it's coming from the patient's mouth. Well, of course, with this patient, you inject waters into the root of somewhere in the palate. So the current treatment options, it's always good to involve the voice therapy because at least there are patients that it may be a muscle tension dysphonia, uh, and also for support for these patients. But we know the gold standard is borderline and toxin, then we'll have the other therapy that I've mentioned earlier. Um, again, I've skipped injecting into the TA because we've had lots of that. But I just put a couple of slides, just to deviate slightly, uh, especially for the abductor spasmodic dysphonia. Uh, there is a bit of a controversial area because it's the rare cause of it, and the treatment is, is it was difficult muscle to get access to. So sometimes people don't even believe it exists because maybe they miss the muscle, or maybe it's not the right thing. So there are different ways you can see that you can access the PCA, you can go through the, the Yena technique, as I call it, through the larynx, or you can go from the sides, so at the level of the crack where you aim your needle as if you're going to hit the uh, opposite shoulder, and you rotate. This is the Americans love that, you rotate it that way and then you hit the back of the uh, crackwood and you ask the patient to sniff and then you get it. Or you can do uh, transoral with a long transoral needle. You can actually see the back of the uh, aretinos and the crackwood and inject it. You can even use a needle in the channel endoscope uh, to inject into this area. All of these ones, you can do that. Uh, initially, I, I was hesitant, but you go to conferences and by the time you listen to so many speakers, you know that there are so many different ways to skin the cat. So I never say to people that, sorry, <laughs> we drag a cat. <laughs> Have you got a cat? Yes. Right? So don't go sit on the cat then. <laughs> there are different ways to clothe the cat. Uh, so I never say that this is the only way, because soon you're going to know that actually people are doing things differently and it works for them. So you just Go with an open mind, learn different techniques, yeah. and you're going to choose what works best, better for you. So this is uh, Abby. So she comes every three months for her injection. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Normally with the Abby doctor, 61, 62, 63 will be more difficult for them. So that's the needle. You, know, you can actually ask the patient to puff their cheeks, and when they do that, you can see the back of the car code, the aretinoid, and it's very clear, and you can see a flap of the bottles going in there. So normally I just inject one side just to minimize risk of stride for this patient. Uh, I normally inject like three units on one side, and, that, and that's it, done. You can also use uh, endoscopic, we use um, uh, the, the needle, the, you know, the fiber needle, go through the channel, and then inject over there. The downside of that, you have to be very careful because when you put the needle in, there's nothing to hold it in the tissue, so it may prolapse back into the scope. So you have to explain to your assistant thoroughly that you push that in, and you have to push your scope as well. So I'm going to show you in the next video, this is a patient again with, uh, well, you could call it muscle tension dysphonia, but some people think spasmodic dysphonia can affect the false coat as well. So this patient, I inject this patient in the false coat. And with the force code, you can use different techniques. You can go transorally, you can use parohyoids. You can even go from cut to thyroid if you like, but you have to numb the larynx, or you can go endoscopically with a needle. So there's different ways at your disposal. You don't have to go expensive with some machines or like ENG if you don't have it. But if you have it, then you can use it as well for the TS one. But for the force code, this is local anesthetic. I'm just gonna explain this a little because it's very important. When you're gonna do any office procedure, anything in the larynx, the key is local anesthesia. But there are different ways, there are different types. 
you can spray directly with the nozzle there. You can inject like uh, uh, yeah, do it into the trachea and there's uh, the patient to cough. But if you're going to do extensive office procedure like laser, injection, biopsy, everything, then you need to be, be able to do the anesthesia adequately. My favorite technique is using the, uh, we call it epidural catheter. So I pass it through the channel endoscope because it's less dead space there. And then I'll ask the patient to call it E, and then the whole place will be old numb. You can take a lot of this patient that we list. So that's the needle going in there. And then inject. So normally for the false code, I'll inject up to three units on each side. Because this yeah, so this is a patient that with the TA is not working for that much. Uh, instead, they get breathy voice much, so I inject it into the, uh, into the uh, false code. The next slide, I've just added it actually when I was here, uh, single dystonia. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, people have had this, but after listening to your talk, I thought probably it's good to just add this uh, in case you come across. So this is a patient that. Speaking is fine, but when she starts singing, she can't. Well, I thought I had singer's dystonia as well because I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> this patient is a real singer, so you're gonna hear the voice. So this is before the injection. The voice is fine, speaking well, no problem. Anyway, I inject Botox. Normally I use um, EMG guided, but because this is a new thing and I've asked, I've checked my colleague, what international, have like a WhatsApp group, what ideas, and uh, some people say, I've seen one, some said I've had one, and that idea. So I said, okay, I'm gonna start with a small dose, 1.5 units. I want to be sure that it's in the right place in the TA. Uh, so this is why I do that with a direct view that Faro hired, just inject on both sides. Uh, just like you do when you do for cocoa augmentation. So I injected 1.5 minutes, but I think now I'm injecting her with two minutes because she wants it to last longer. So and this is the uh, first injection. Do it again. So and there's another, this, this patient, she sent a video recording of her voice singing. She couldn't do that before the Botox, but with the Botox, she's gone back to stage. Good morning. Anyway, so that's all about Botox now. So quickly, I'm going to ramble through the surgical the slide, which is... Sorry, this is one poor question. Um, I have one question. In the singer's dystonia with that special patient, which muscle do you suspect is the actual dystonic one? Is it really the... Yeah. Okay. I injected the Botox into the TA. Wow. Uh, both. So I started 1.5 units. Yeah, hey, I, I know you injected into the TA, but do you suspect that the TA is the real um, spasmodic one in, in this? Well, good question. I don't know. Uh, when we inject patients with adductor spasmodic dysphonia, is it just the TA? Maybe not. I don't think it's just a TA. I think all the adductor muscles, maybe even the PCA, so are involved as well, but one is dominant. Yeah, yeah. And usually the LCA are more dominant, uh, but if you inject directly into the LCA, then the patient will have prolonged uh, breathiness. So the compromise, I think, the TA, just to take the edge off. Yeah, yeah. Is it? What does it not? All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, SLAD stands for selective laryngeal uh, denervation and re-innovation. So, selective laryngeal adductor denervation. So, what it means is you cut the supply to the 
adapter. But if you leave it again, it will just grow back. So you cut it and then implant it into that. This is still like hocus pocus to me because I've, I don't understand it, to be honest. So maybe many people don't. And this is why no one does it in the, Does anyone do it in Europe? You know, anybody? Can you invite them next year? No. Um, but I think the groundbreaking, I don't know if you want to recognize uh, Professor, Professor Ishiki, uh, who sadly passed away uh, August last year at the age of 96. This guy was operating up until the age of 92. I assisted him at that age. Yeah, no tremor, no dystonia at all when he does surgery at that age. Uh, so I was opportunity to spend some time with him and learn all these techniques and see it from the muscles. But it tied to really the whole idea is to separate the anterior condition. It's an operation done under local anesthetic. And I think it's going to be probably the main flow surgery in the future. It's not as perfect as the spasmodic or as the Botox when you do that. But it does reduce the tension. It's done on the local anesthetic. Uh, so you do laryngofacia and then open the anterior commissure and then you measure with a caliper how much uh, to separate it. And that way the patient will tell you that the strain in the voice is gone. Uh, so again, uh, you, the equipment that you need, let's see if I can get the. Uh, so you're going to need any neck tray, the titanium bridges, the titan sizer, catalyst sprayer the knife and the all the bits and pieces there. But again, really the main equipment here, the two most important equipment here, uh, the implant is said we need two of them and then the measuring caliper. So this measure, it measures at uh, one millimeter, two millimeter, uh, 2.5 millimeter. It depends on how much you want to separate the larynx. So you make the cut anteriorly. And then once you find the right diameter, the patient will change the voice is good. And then you stitch this back. And um, and this is what it looks like endoscopically. So this was my patient because we didn't have the license in the UK, so I had to travel to Kyoto and operate with uh, Ishiki and uh, and his team over there. And this was the lady. Uh, Come one, two, three for me. This is the voice before her. I had to be injecting her like three units of water last long. That was once a young app aimed at Arthur who would never take was once a young this is after. Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Yeah, somebody wants to ask a question. One, two, three, four, ten. One hour. Oh, yeah, he's a permanent surgeon, yeah. Excellent, well done, you. Yeah. <laughs> this lady, she had her surgery in 2015, and she never looked back. So it's over seven years now. So I have three of my patients that went over there to do that, and none of them ever had. Do you think it's the fact that they're being split apart? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's the fact that you're essentially creating a distance? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, because it's, it, the reason why it works. the experience is that in the voice, it's the front of the vocal cord. It's not the vocal process. When you do vocal cord injection augmentation, we advise them not to go too anterior because if you inject very close to the anterior commission, the voice got very tight, like they have spasmodic dysphonia. Yeah, so again, this is where you have the strain. And if you just separate it by just a couple of millimeters, you'll be amazed how breathy the voice can become. So again, complications, maybe surgical emphysema. So when you make the laryngofacia, it's very important not to bridge the gap there. Uh, the patient may have breathy voice, uh, e extrusion of the implant, kind of a fracture of the implant, as you can see here. There may be recurrence because the symptoms may get very worse after that. But again, the outcome is very good. You can see the VHS score here, yeah, it's maintained over a long time. When you compare it to both, it's similar as well. Uh, maybe they said the type two even have better outcome because they have the reassurance that the voice is not going to fluctuate every month. Uh, the Botox, when it works, is fantastic, but if it's not quite enough, then they get very emotional again and the outcome changes, which is why when you ever, when, if you ever give the questionnaire when they come to your clinic with the Botox, they always call like 30 at the maximum. You need the voice is good. It's because there's so many aspects of this aspect of the that affects this patient. Uh, so we're working very hard. This is the Japanese team here. We've been to uh, see the training uh, in Kyoto. Uh, and hopefully, when it becomes licensed in Europe, uh, we're running a phono surgery course in, in London, uh, where you'll be certified to to have uh, for the company will supply you with the with the implant. So watch out for this space. 
once we have the CE mark, we'll be able to offer uh, this treatment for the patients. And last uh, topic is the CO2 laser, uh, which is what you want to do with the Botox because the Botox want to remove that. So this operation, it's, it's sadly, uh, the recurrence is high. It's just bizarre what happens. Even when you remove lots of muscles, you cut the nerves, 50% recurrence rate. So when you do this, when you offer this operation to patients, it's very important to tell them that there's a chance that you're going to go back again and redo it, maybe even for the third time. So this is one of my patients. The voice isn't too bad initially because I give Botox to this guy for two or three months, uh, but he's he got sick of it. Five minutes. Okay. One. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Can you tell me your favourite hobby, please? Okay, um, favourite hobby is um, golf, um, which I don't play enough of, um, but I do enjoy um, going on the golf course, and uh, especially when it's good weather. And um, yeah, and even even watching golf um, right. so and tournaments um, and watching it on TV. This surgery, I, I always take the first coach. Um, yeah, well, it's, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a British Open uh, this weekend. The main so, yeah, I'll be, is um, so I'll be watching the laryngeal ventricles properly. Uh, and also, the force could sometimes contribute to the dystonia as well. One. And this is what it two, looks like one half time. Three. Even though there's a big four, there, you'll be amazed. Five. Bit of granulation there, would, which is settled down by itself, and this is his voice. Ten for me, please. One, two, three, four, five, six. But it seven, works for this patient eight, for twelve months, and then nine, after that he comes back ten, again and had to inject his bulbox, smaller one, dose. And again, this is another lady. Just uh, the spasmodic dysphonia. One, two, three, four. It wasn't long one, since I injected her here, so the voice is not too bad. Is Isabel. Uh, pretty girl and pretty young, 18. And again, to check the false code because you want to see the laryngeal ventricular area properly. Otherwise, there's a risk you're going to hit the focal cord with your laser. So that could be a problem. And as much as possible, the uh, TM uh, muscles. And you can find the nerve actually more posteriorly and then cut the nerve. And. One to five for me. One, two, three, four, five. Can you do the days of the week for me, please? The voice of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, So you have to be Thursday, careful when you're doing Friday, the laser that you don't Saturday, make a hole through Sunday. into the subglotic area. So you have to be always constantly visualizing it. And if needed, even have a look with the telescope. This is the parallel cartilage there. You don't want to laser too much into the parallel cartilage, otherwise you have to keep granulation there. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the larynx looks like. Saturday, you, you, you know, it's almost like you've done some total larynxation in there, and it's popular. And if you respect the larynx, if you know the boundaries, you, you're not going to cause much damage. But if you just go blind, blindly without knowing where you're going, you hack everywhere, that's when you run into trouble. But if you know your anatomy, you know the areas not to go into, that's when you will have more out, uh, less complication. So, take on message. Uh, this is our prime minister, by the way, when he was in cancer. Two types of spasmodic dysphoria, maybe more than two types. Somebody was telling me now from the crowd. But now we took some A is a standard treatment. Very good results. The surgical outcome now we know, uh, and I think we shouldn't brush it away. I think we should anything that comes near we should learn. We should we shouldn't discard it. And this is how science develops all the time. If you go, no, oh, no, I'm not going to do this now, you're not going to learn anything. You're just going to be in the dark ages then. Thank you very much.